Hello, everyone, and welcome to our October version of Food Biz Plus with the Food Business School. I'm Kathy Joran, the director of the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. The Food Business School is our executive and graduate education division of the Culinary Institute of America. Our mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food systems challenges and what we also see are its, as its greatest business opportunities. Today we are talking with Lisa Curtis. Lisa is the founder and CEO of Cooley Cooley Foods, and we're going to learn how Lisa started and is growing a business that is focused on a nutrient-rich food product, but also significantly is built around a strategy and a mission of social impact in nutritional security for at-risk populations, in economic growth, and in environmental sustainability. Please welcome Lisa Curtis from Cooley Cooley Foods. Hi, Kathy, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining, Thank you for joining us. us. Welcome to Food Biz Plus. So let's uh, start, Lisa, by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in building a food business on a, with a social mission. Yeah. So I first started working with this plant called Moringa um, back in 2010, actually, was when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, West Africa. And I was in this really small village with no running water, no electricity, and not a lot of healthy food. And so I am a vegetarian and found myself mostly eating millet and rice and starting to feel really tired all the time, um, early signs of mal malnutrition on that diet. And so I turned to a couple of the women in the village I was working with and said, you know, what can I eat that would make me feel better? And they pulled these leaves off a tree and mixed them into a popular West African snack called Kuli Kuli and said, here, eat this, it'll make you feel better. Um, so I started eating it, made me feel a lot more nourished. I think the, you know, the combination of complete protein, calcium, iron, and vitamins um, all just came together and, and made me feel really good. And I, I started to do a little research and was like, what is this plant? You know, how, like, why is it making me feel so great? And found that Moringa is a tree that grows all over the tropics. It's one of the most nutrient-dense plants on the planet. Um, so in addition to being a complete protein, it has calcium, iron, vitamins, um, and saw an incredible opportunity to help some of the women in my village and other women you know, around the world like them grow more Moringa, use it to improve nutrition locally, and then help them earn a sustainable livelihood by selling that Moringa here to the U.S. Fabulous. Were they using it as a business enterprise at the time? So, you know, Moringa is uh, sort of like kale was in America like 10 years ago. Do you know who the biggest purchaser of kale was 10 years ago by chance? I don't. That was one of my favorite facts. <laughs> um, it was Pizza Hut. It was actually Pizza Hut, yeah. which, you know, it seems oh unbelievable today, but it wasn't, um, they weren't buying it for their pizzas or even for, you know, to put inside their salad bar. They were actually buying it as decoration to go on top of the salad bar. Um, and just think about how far we've come. So um, Moringa is kind of like the, the backyard weed that kale was 10 years ago here. Um, so a lot of people, you know, would eat it when they have nothing else to eat. Um, they saw it as kind of this bitter green that they, they didn't really love. Um, and so our goal with Cooley Cooley is how do we make Moringa nutritious and delicious and use it to improve um, nutrition and livelihoods around the world. So it starts in the communities where we source and then ends here in the U.S. where we sell our Moringa products. Fabulous. Can you describe a little bit of the process of your path from inception to launch and the general timeline? Yeah, so the timeline, um, you know, it, it always takes longer than you think it will. 
Um, so I returned from Peace Corps in 2011, um, really excited about Moringa, but you know, had had no clue how to start a food company. So maybe I could have used the food business school back then. Um, if it had existed, um, but I ended up, you know, starting just kind of doing a lot of research and, and talking to a lot of folks who are in the food industry, trying to understand, like, how, how do you go about doing this? Um, and then wanted to test the market. So the first product we made was actually these bars. So we'll do a little show and tell here. Um, so the, so kind of realized that like, you know, not everybody knew what Moringa was, um, so didn't want to put it in a product that was like too far away from what people already knew. And, and everybody knows what to do with a bar. We know bars are healthy. Um, so started there and started actually making it by hand in a commercial kitchen um, and then doing a lot of testing at farmer's markets and um, actually sampled, did what's called like a shotgun survey to everybody who came by. So. Um, took down their, you know, name or, you know, gender, approximate age, um, if they bought anything, if, you know, what they tried, and, and then we could measure our conversion from sample to sale and understand, um, get a sense of, like, who our demographic was. Um, and so we, right. we got we got the really good results. We were getting, you know, over 20% of customers who sampled purchasing, which in our, from what we had understood, anything over like 15 was really good. Um, and so that, that gave us the initial kind of like, okay, this is, this is something people want. Now let's launch it. Excellent. And so from there, how did you expand to other products and launch into a larger business? Yeah. Um, so from there, I think one of the things we figured out pretty quickly is that uh, starting a food business is expensive. You know, there's a lot of costs in manufacturing. There's a lot of costs in getting on store shelves. Um, and so we started fundraising. We actually did an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so we talked, you know, did a lot of work to, to put together a really good video and, and put together a whole um, campaign around Moringa. And, and basically we were, we were pre-selling these bars. So we were saying, you know, if you back this, you'll get bars in return. Um, and we ended up raising $53,000 from 800 people in like 30 different countries. Um, so it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, and that gave us enough money to do our first manufacturing run. So we were no longer making the bars by hand. We were able to manufacture. Um, and then we presented to Whole Foods Market, Northern California. And they got excited about it and said, okay, well, we'll test it out. We'll bring it in. Um, I thought I had made it. I was like, okay, we've got it. We've got Whole Foods. You know, we're good to go. Um, what I didn't realize is that it wasn't quite so easy. Uh, they had approved us for all 45 stores in Northern California, but um, actually had to sell it in store by store. So my job yeah. for the first, you know, eight months of the company was very glamorous. I was driving around Whole Foods store to Whole Foods store, selling in products, and then I would stay there for a couple hours and I would do a demo to sell through the products. That was kind of my mm -hmm. pitch. If you bring them in, I'll stand here and I'll sell them for you. <laughs> um, Demo and tasting. Demo yeah. tasting, yeah, yeah, very important uh, to you know get consumers to try it, and uh, particularly with a new product, a, a new ingredient that people hadn't heard of, um, found that people really wanted to try before they buy. So uh, that that was kind of the first market launch, and then um, started attending some of the trade shows, so Fancy Food Expo West, um, talking to other buyers, um, got other folks interested. So in this was kind of launched onto the market in 2014. Um, in 2015, we then, uh, and so we, we were just in sort of a handful of stores in Northern California. Um, 2015, we started launching across the entire West Coast. Um, and we actually launched our Pure Moringa Powder. So that's this guy. Um, and it was an interesting moment for us. Um, we weren't sure if people were gonna know what to do with Moringa. You know, it is 
it is like a earthy green. Some people really love it and some people are like, oh, maybe a little too green. Um, but we found the, mm. the market response was incredible. People love the idea they could just, you know, put a spoonful into their smoothies or add it to their pestos or baked goods and that they're getting so much nutrition in one little scoop of, of this amazing green. Um, and so that became very successful. And then um, we expanded onto the East Coast, and then in 2016, we launched Nationwide. And is that all through Whole Foods or through other different that markets? That was, um, Whole Foods was the retailer that took us nationwide. Um, Whole Foods was about 70% of our business for the first couple years. Um, they're now, you know, a little less than half, so we do have a lot of other retailers, but um, I, I give them a lot of credit. We actually just got their Supplier of the Year award, which is very cool. Um, so, yeah, they, they did a, a lot to help us get off the ground. Um, so did you have to sell into the other markets, or did they find you at the fancy food show, or how did you connect with other markets besides Yeah, that? so one of the biggest things that I really tried to do at the early days, even in the farmer's markets, was to, to develop out a sales story and to really think about how I could build a, a super compelling story that would make buyers automatically say yes. So in the farmer's markets, it was getting that demographic data of like who is the customer and what's our conversion rate. Um, and that sort of helped me sell into Whole Foods. Once we were in Whole Foods, I was very, very focused on how do I build a sales story of like if you bring this far into your store, that it will fly off the shelves. Because um, the biggest thing for buyers, you know, everybody thinks they've made it once they get onto the shelf. But that's not actually the hardest part. Mm -hmm. The hardest part is getting off the shelf. Um, so, yes, yeah, so so that was my big thing. If you don't get off the shelf, then you're not going to yeah, stay Yeah, if, right? if, if you stay on that, if you're just there, you're not moving. Um, nobody's very happy about that. Um, so I really focused on, on demos were the initial ones, and then also doing events and um, you know talking do, do talking to the press trying to get a lot of local press um, and trying to really build it up in one little region just in Northern California um, and just within Whole Foods to, to show the velocity um, and then once we mm -hmm. had a, a sales story of like hey you know we're selling five bars per store per week um, you know if you bring us in we're gonna do that here and if you bring us into a hundred of your stores, that's going to be, you know, half a million dollars within the, the next year or whatever, whatever it was. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was, that was a big part of us getting buyers on board um, because they were taking a chance, you know, they were taking a chance on a very new company. Um, they were taking a chance on a very young founder um, and they were taking on a chance on an ingredient that they most of them had never heard of. Um, so try to really put together a compelling pitch on, on why this was a chance worth taking. Right. And considering your demographic, and maybe you can describe that a little bit, the story is so important to the sale of the product, right? It's not just about the product, but it's about you and your story and the business uh, goals of your company. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, that's why. I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, I'm I, I don't have a culinary background, although I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm really in it for the mission and for the impact that I think this plant can and is having. Um, the th the interesting part for me is, you know, when I first started demoing the product and talking to customers, I would always lead with that. I was like, oh, I started, you know, working with this plant in the Peace Corps, and I've seen it can help uplift women it can help restore the environment it's so important um, and pretty quickly found that uh, people buy products first and foremost because of what it's going to do them for them they buy products because mm -hmm. you know it tastes good or it like is really good for them and hopefully you know some combination of both of those things um, and so what we've found is that people buy the product because it's like oh this is you know 
a super green. I can add it to my smoothie. It, um, you know, is gonna make my mornings easier because I don't have to like tear up kale leaves. Um, but then they're gonna tell their friends because maybe they look on the back and they're like, oh, hey, this, you know, supports women farmers and helps plant trees around the world. Like maybe I'm gonna look that up online. I'm gonna learn a little more. I'm gonna hear that actually there's like a lot of depth to this brand that we're not just selling food that we're selling like a way to to grow crops sustainably and a way to support people in other countries and um and and then they kind of think to themselves that's something i want to be a part of so you know they maybe share it on instagram or they talk to their best friend and be like you should try this like coolie fluid moringa powder like made me feel good and it's like really good for the world um, and so I think that's how we have sort of a virality to our brand that isn't necessarily um, something you get when you're, uh, you know, any normal, well, now that we're abnormal food business, but we're, we're kind of trying to do um, more than just food. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that uh, there's a specific demographic that your products appeal to that that kind of environmental and social impact is more important to than others? Yeah, so we, we talk a lot about our, our target customer. Um, we've got a couple of names for her. Um, so we think that we started with Co-op Kathy. Um, Co-op Kathy is sort of like your crunchy friend that you can imagine of who's like in there in the store, like reading the back of every ingredient label, like has all sorts of like superfoods and crazy things in her kitchen that you've, you know, never heard of and never will hear again. Um, and that's kind of where we started. We think we're now um, we, we still have Co-op Kathy. We love Co-op Kathy. Um, but we think we're now reaching who we call like Superfood Sophia. Um, so somebody who is, she's, you know, not on the sort of bleeding edge of trying the newest thing, but is very interested in wellness and um, has a busy, active lifestyle. And so wants products that are convenient and healthy and make her feel really good. Um, and she likes that, you know, she likes to have sort of her, align her life around her values. So she likes that Cooley Cooley is a mission driven company and she likes that, um, you know, she will try to, she'll drive a Prius instead of a, you know, <laughs> like gas guzzling SUV that she tries to do little things to kind of make the world a better place when and where it fits into her life. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about how you built your team and how quickly you had to build build your team yeah. to to be achieving the success that you are at this point. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because I think um, teams are so important and sometimes people just see the, like the figurehead, like they see somebody like me and they're like, oh my God, you did it all. And one of the things I really try to emphasize is this is a team sport. Like you cannot do this alone. You've got to have a great team and you've got to have people you trust. Um, and so it started out actually with some of my childhood best friends. Um, so when I got back from Peace Corps, one of my friends at the time was working at a food product development company. So thankfully one of us had some food expertise um, and she was was really interested and you know had never had never heard of moringa, had never been anywhere where moringa grows. Um, but this idea of like that she could, create a product that you know was hers that she created herself like for her own company and also that it was a product that had a lot of potential to create a positive impact around the world and have sort of that ripple effect like that was really compelling to her um, so I sort of hooked her in um, and then I had a, another friend um, who I went to high school with who is you know amazing Amazing startup guy worked at Facebook, worked at Tesla as a software engineer, kind of jack of all trades, and um, he really loved this idea of like how do we tell a new story about the developing world in general and about Africa in particular? Because so much of the time you hear, you know, poverty and AIDS, and you just don't get the full story of entrepreneurship and of all of the amazing things that so many African entrepreneurs are doing. And so we really try to tell the story of the entrepreneurs we work with and their businesses and, you know, how they are 
impacting their communities and, and what growing Moringa means to them and, and their livelihoods and the livelihood of their community. And so that, um, that kind of hooked him in. Um, and then we, so the three of us sort of started just meeting like on once a week, we all had day jobs. We were working other places. Um, we'd actually meet um, at the Metreon, <laughs> believe it or not, in San Francisco. It has free Wi-Fi. So it was like, okay, it's central, near BART, free Wi-Fi. Um, and we would we'd talk and, and sort of plan. Um, and then it finally, finally with uh, you know, with the crowdfunding campaign being successful and with all the consumer research showing success, then it meant, okay, I've got to, got to, somebody's got to take the leap. Um, so I quit my day job. Um, and one of the things that I try to tell people, you know, sometimes it feels like you all got to do it at once and it's got to be this big thing. And, and, and for me, it really felt like, okay, you know, this business now requires me full time, but I think it wasn't until we actually got into distribution and, and got the product onto the market that I really had enough to do it all full time. And, um, and then, you know, it pretty quickly was like, okay, it's now something that it just can't be Lisa doing this alone. Now we got to have more people. Um, and so then sort of one by one, my co-founders quit my day, quit their day jobs and, and came on full time. And, um, you know, probably the hardest thing at the beginning is that it's it's very difficult to to pay yourself anything when you're at that early stage. So um, I did a bunch right. of communications consulting and different side jobs um, to make it all work until the the company was able to to pay me and my co-founders. Have you had to uh, have additional rounds of funding? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I tell people, I think I've raised money in every single format that there is. Um, so we did crowdfunding with Indiegogo. Um, we then did a Kiva crowdfunded loan. So it's a zero interest loan, which is a, a really good option too. Um, we then did equity crowdfunding with AgFunder, where um, basically people are, investors are investing in your company, but they're sort of doing it in this online platform way. Um, then we, so we were basically all crowdfunded for the beginning. Um, and then we did a, so that got us to about half a million dollars in funding. Um, then we got the news from Whole Foods that they wanted to launch us nationwide, which great lesson there. If you can ever raise around a launch, that is the time to do it. Um, it was so much easier to raise another half million dollars. We raised it within about three months. Um, so we did a, a million dollar total seed round. Um, and then in the end of 2016, so about two years ago, um, did a round, a series A that was actually led by Kellogg. Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting in the food world today is that there are big strategic CPGs that are really interested in startups. Um, so had an amazing chat with the CEO of Kellogg um, for like an hour and he kept telling me and my co-founders, he's like, I don't know how to do what you guys are doing. I want to learn from you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you want to learn from us? Like we're, a, you know, rounding error in your balance sheet. Um, but, but I think there's this like interesting collaboration that can happen between big companies and small companies within the food world. Um, and then we are actually mm -hmm. now uh, just <laughs> just kind of uh, raising, just started last month actually raising our Series B. So this will be our third round of funding. Excellent. And is your goal to continue to grow the company on your own, or are you thinking you would ultimately like to sell it to a larger corporation, or do you have any of that in mind at this point? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one of the things that I did before taking on any venture capital or outside investment was to change the company's legal structure from a C corporation, which most businesses are either LLCs or C corporations, um, into a full-fledged right. benefit corporation. Um, and so with a benefit corporation, you can actually sort of write into your legal DNA that your goal as a company isn't just to maximize profit, that it's also to maximize impact. And so we defined that for us as using nutrient-rich plants like Moringa as a tool to improve nutrition and livelihoods worldwide. 
Um, so for me, that's the, that's the litmus test. Of, you know, if down the line we find a, a partner like a, a Kellogg or a General Mills or Dannon or, or somebody else who aligns with that mission and, and wants to help us grow, but wants to help us grow within those strict parameters of, of running a triple bottom line company, we're, we're definitely open to it. I think, you know, food is an economies of scale game and, and sometimes it's, it's hard to be a little fish in this big <laughs> pond. Um, but that, that is, that has to be a part of the deal um, for me. Well, that's great. That really, really speaks to your values and what you're really trying to do with the company. What um, you had mentioned at the beginning that your initial investors through Indiegogo were from 30 countries, but you are only selling product in the U.S., correct? We are. Were those yeah. supporters just because they were interested in your mission? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know. I don't know all 800 of them. I probably only know like. 30 of them um and so we had mm -hmm. yeah people from all over the world i think that that to me is kind of one of the cool things about being a social enterprise and an impact oriented organization is that um people resonate with it the story in a different way um i think there were a lot there were a lot of people and we know this because we like got all these crazy emails it was like there was one so i you know sent it out to my friends uh, one of my friends sent it to her mom and her mom sent it out to a couple of her friends. And so my friend's mom's friend like wrote this email about how she saw the video and just started crying because she thought that this was the type of like business that like we needed. And it just gave her so much hope for the future. And then she like donated a hundred dollars. Um, so yeah, there were amazing stories like that. Where I was like, I don't, I don't know you. I probably will never meet you in my life, but it, it was just really touching how it it resonated with people. That's fabulous. Um, talk a little bit about your the product itself. How any challenges with importing a raw ingredient like moringa, and then finding a co-packer, developing new products, things like that. Yeah, um, lots of challenges. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as as you probably know, like Moringa, Moringa wasn't really sold in the U.S. until Kuli Kuli came along. So this was an entirely new ingredient. So one of the first things we had to do was figure out how we could get it, um, basically what's known as, as FDA GRAS, G-R-A-S, generally recognized as safe. And so even though this tree grows all over the world, even though it's commonly eaten in so many places, um, because it wasn't a common use food in America, we had to prove out that it was safe for American consumption. Um, and that was one of the first big challenges because um, we got quotes and, mm -hmm. you know, people told us this is going to be $70,000 to do. And at the time, you know, I had just gotten out of Peace Corps and I was like, I've got $2,000 in my bank account. I don't know where the rest of this is going to come from. Um, and thankfully had this amazing person who's now one of our scientific advisors at Johns Hopkins, um, who does, who researches Moringa all day, every day, and really stepped up to the plate and said, you know, I will work with you pro bono and I will help you put together a grass notice. Um, and then we got had a legal team that similarly pro bono um, took a look at it. So got a lot of support. Um, one of the things I've learned is to ask for help <laughs> along the way. Um, we also found a, a good customs broker um, because certainly navigating the U.S. customs and, you know, we at the beginning were just sort of shipping like 2,500 kilos at a time. So it's mostly coming in air freight on planes. Um, we're now doing like 10 metric tons, so a full size shipping container. <laughs> full, and we're doing, you know, oh over goodness. 200 of those a year. So lots and lots of shipping containers full of Moringa coming from different parts of Africa, different parts of South America, even a little bit in Southeast Asia. We've expanded a ton. Um, and so that has been a logistical um, complexity to navigate that. Um, so we now have one person on our team who all she does all day, 
every day is source moringa um, and work with moringa farmers and um, so it's a combination of sort of logistically getting it here and then also coaching a lot of the moringa farmers because a lot of them have never exported a product and um, hitting u.s standards is not easy so we do a lot to support them to meet our standards um, and so once the product gets here so once we've got you know the, the raw ingredients here um, then we have three different co-packers so um, you know we've got got bars we've got powder <laughs> um, and then we also have energy shots <laughs> and all of those require a different co-manufacturer um, so finding those was kind of the internet research at plus like sent some you know asked some of our advisors do you have anyone you recommend um, talked to a few different ones and, and found on some great co-packers and so they so we then send the moringa powder to them and they turn it into bars turn it into shots and then turn it into powder Boy, there's so many different elements to developing this business and do you find that your partners and co-packers are uh, aligned with your mission as well yeah i think they they feel really good about it um you know they're Definitely, um, you know, some of them are like our, our bar co packer is, is very mission driven. Like they've done a lot to try to become a, a fully like renewable facility and have been doing a lot um, just kind of within their own team. Um, some of the other co packers are maybe just more traditional factories, um, but I think they do appreciate working with us and, um, you know, are, are doing a good job. We certainly try as much as possible to encourage all of the partners we work with to, to you know, push the limit on environmental and social impact. Um, that definitely gets easier as you get bigger because then you become a bigger voice um, as opposed to when you're, you know, on the smaller side of, and their customers are they're less likely to listen to you. Right, right. A um, couple of questions that have come in from our listeners about the impact. One is, how do you measure success of the social benefits of the company? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so we look at uh, success impact-wise across three different areas. Um, so first and foremost, and this one's actually really easy to calculate, it's livelihoods. Like, are we creating a sustainable livelihood for small farmers in the developing world? Um, and one of the easiest, this is, you know, pretty straightforward to measure. It's like, how much Moringa did we purchase from small farmers? By the end of this year, it'll be about $2 million. Um, so that is income they would not have otherwise had. Um, so that's a, a great one. Um, we then, you know, we try to, when we do surveys, we try to understand, like, how are they using that income? And um, we're not as quantitative as we would like. We haven't had sort of an outside third party researcher come and audit all of the, the different farms, but we have heard um, a lot that, you know, people are using this this money to invest in their children's education, to purchase better foods for their families, um, that kind of thing. So it's, you know, awesome to hear all of those stories. Uh, the second thing we really focus on is environmental impact. Um, and so the, the most straightforward measurement of this is like how many Moringa trees were planted due to Cooley Cooley's purchasing. Um, so we're up to over a million trees planted. Um, and the cool thing about Moringa is that those trees keep growing. Um, basically, we, we pick the leaves off the tree every three or so months, the leaves grow back, tree survives, tree is fine, pick the leaves again. Um, so it doesn't hurt the tree at all. And there's just, you know, there's a lot of, lot of environmental benefits inherent with that type of regenerative agriculture. Um, we're trying to do even more with our farmers to help them intercrop, to help them really get more efficient with their irrigation tactics so that, you know, we're not using too much water. Um, and we do have kind of a, a scorecard we use to measure all of that and, and, and consistently ask them all about all of that. Um, and then the third thing is nutrition. So we are very much focused on like, how do we get this super nutritious plant, not just to nourish Americans, but also how do we get it to nourish people in the communities where it's being grown? Um, so that's yes. hard to measure because um, it's hard to, you know, unless we're doing sort of a full clinical trial of people pre 
coolie coolie sourcing moringa and people post it's it's hard to get quantitative about that um but a couple of things we we do look at is like you know how many more people are eating moringa in the community um due to coolie coolie sourcing um our stats aren't a hundred percent you know great across all of them but we know by and large, more, way more people are eating Moringa because they're seeing it and they're like, why are all these Americans eating Moringa? This looks pretty cool. Maybe I'm going to try it. Um, we also do a lot around nutritional education. So it's, it's not enough to just have access to Moringa. You know, Moringa grows like a weed in lots of these places where we're sourcing from. So it's not just, not that they're, they can't eat it or grow it. Um, but a lot of times they don't know how to eat it. They don't know why they should eat it. Um, and so in the same way, you know, you like massage kale leaves with lemon juice and salt and make them delicious here in America. Um, we partner and support our, our farmer partners to do education in their communities around how to use Moringa and how to really maximize the nutritional benefits. So we often find people take the leaves and boil them for hours and then dump out all the nutrients. Um, and the same reason you don't want to do that with spinach or kale here in the U.S., you don't want to do that with Moringa. Um, so, yeah, really focused on the, you know, livelihoods, nutrition, and environment. How, how incredible. That's just such a wonderful story. Uh, a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, one is, did you work with an ad agency to develop your brand, or did you develop that in-house? Yeah, actually all in-house. Um, we got very, very fortunate. Um, so when it was sort of three of us that started up and you know started working on this on the side, and we were doing testing at farmer's markets in these little like handmade bars um, and came across kind of a friend of a friend, this amazing graphic designer um, named Annie, and she agreed to basically, you know, do oh, get some equity and become a, a late co-founder and build our entire brand from scratch. And um, I think she did an amazing job. We hear all the time that our, our packaging really pops and that Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. And then uh, let's move on to, because this also came in as a question about lessons learned. What were some of your biggest challenges in integrating social enterprise principles into your business? Yeah, um, lots of lots of lessons learned. I think um, you know lessons around just like running a business overall. Um, but then on the social enterprise piece in particular, you know, one of the interesting things that um, that sort of happened when I first launched was I had this idea of like, okay, we're only going to source for women-led farming cooperatives in West Africa. Like that is why I'm starting this business. This is why we're doing it. Um, and then pretty quickly as we grew, that we realized there were a lot of farmers who – had these amazing organizations that were like, you know, like similar to us, sort of for-profit social enterprises, but were like paying their employees incredibly well, we're doing a lot of great work in their communities, we're providing benefits. Um, and, you know, some of them really made the case to me and they said, you know, hey, cooperatives are great, but they're not the only way to make an impact. Um, you know, maybe you should, maybe you should consider and reconsider and, and also think about like, you know, there, we, there's a lot of men who've been left behind too. So how do we also integrate them into our supply chain? Um, so we started off, you know, first two years, it was hundred percent only women led farming cooperatives. And then, um, as we've grown, we found a lot of other amazing organizations who do have a really strong focus on like we want women in positions of leadership and we want equity across our supply chain um, and you know we we emphasize that to our suppliers and we really we test them on that and um, ask how much they pay female employees or male employees ask how many people in management are female and um, often because we are their largest customer we find asking and tracking those questions can help kind of spur them in the right direction. Um, but we, yeah, we have, have had to be flexible in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Somebody else asked, did you have any specific failures while working and developing your, your business? And if so, how did you motivate yourself to move beyond that and, and get past that and continue to grow? Have any um, every day, uh, I fail all the time. <laughs> it is part of a startup. I think, you know, some days you're on the top of the world and other days you're like in the bottom of this hole being like, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know how to do this. <laughs> um, I think in terms of some specific failures um, and sort of thinking about what are the lessons that other people could pull out of those failures, I think I started fundraising a little bit too early. Um, raising that first $500,000 was like pulling teeth. It was um, just basically a, a lesson in how to get rejected every day and, and keep getting out of bed, um, which was a good lesson. Um, but it was a lot of time, and it, it took a lot of energy. Um, and I think it took more time and energy than it should have. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I could have done it much differently. Again, coming out of Peace Corps, you're not exactly like super wealthy and have a lot of startup capital. But um, I think, you know, if possible, um, not fundraising too early and, and really thinking through like, what are the things that you can do in your business that don't require much or any capital? So, you know, for us, like, consumer research at farmers markets. Like some brands spend, you know, $100,000 on consumer research. Well, we found we got really good consumer research just by going out there and, and surveying people and asking questions. Um, I think another failure um, has been uh, just making sure that everyone on my team was in the right seat. Because um, the thing about you know, a company that's really fast growing is that the business needs change and you sort of have to figure out, okay, can this person change with the business needs or is what this person wants actually something totally different than what Cooley Cooley can offer them? And maybe they're an amazing person, maybe they're an amazing worker, but maybe they're not the right person fit anymore. Um, and so I think I've sometimes been a little bit too slow and it has hurt the company and me not recognizing that soon enough. Yeah, that's a challenge yeah, that's a in challenge. any business, right? That's right. Seeing if people Seeing can really evolve, evolve as the company grows and changes and uh, still make use of the person's strengths and make sure that they complement the rest of the team. Yeah. So any um, other things that you would like to let our listeners know specifically, either about challenges or about products? I know you've got your powder and your bars, but you and you've got your energy drinks. Are there other products on the horizon or uh, other plans to expand yeah, into um, different expand avenues? Yeah, we are. Um, so we, you know, have been very much brick and mortar retail focused for the past five years. And now we're starting to do a lot more with e-commerce, um, starting to try to work in food service and try to work with some chefs. So if anybody on the phone, you know, has ideas or wants to try out some Moringa samples, let us know. We have a, a great network of influencers and have worked with some incredible people, including Jose Andres and Tyler Florence. Um, but one of the other big things we're thinking a lot about now is like, you know, we've we've really built this company that has kind of has a, an expertise in some interesting places in the sense that we've built the supply chain from scratch. We are very deeply involved in the communities where we source from. And we've also introduced an entirely new ingredient onto the U.S. market. And so one of the things we're thinking a lot about now are like, what are other plants that grow? in the same communities where we're already sourcing from that we can start to incorporate into our products, you know, into our supply chain um, and start to introduce those alongside Moringa to consumers. So, you know, I just think there's there's so many cool plants out there and there's so many cool plants that I would call like the, the crops of the future, like plants that don't require a lot of water, that are, you know, fast growing and super nutrient dense and
thrive in places um, that are hot and only getting hotter. Right, right, and provide nutrition necessary for, like you're saying, uh, you know, at-risk populations in addition to those of us who can use better food products even in our own, you know, developed population. Yeah, and that's one of the things I think is, is really crazy about the world we live in today is that we have about a billion people who are overnourished, you know, they're overweight, they're, um, you know, struggling with that. And then we have about 800 million who are malnourished. And, and there's even some like interesting gray areas of people who, you know, are overweight, but not getting the right nutrients. So they're also nutrient deficient. And um, I'm really interested in like plants that can help bridge the gap. Like, you know, certainly I, I don't think our moringa powder is going to solve end obesity and solve malnutrition overnight. Um, but I think that, you know, as we sort of start to shift to more nutrient rich plants that can improve nutrition in the places where they're sourced and can Oh, very important and also be something that's really good and sustainable for the environment which is you know finding that combination is definitely not easy so well we really appreciate your participation today Lisa thank you so much your your business is so impressive and we've you know it's just congratulations on everything you've accomplished with this incredible um, products and we look forward to seeing more of them in the future and i would love to see chefs be using them in, in restaurants on the menus right? i would love to too yeah i'll shout out my email um it's super easy thank you so much i appreciate it for our listeners, if you'd like to stay on for just a minute, I'll tell you a little bit about our upcoming uh, uh, next Food Biz Plus, plus a couple of other classes that we have going on. So um, next month, we are going to be, well, first, sorry, excuse me, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of upcoming programs. We have a Concept to Shelf in-person program taking place here at the CIA at Copia in Napa Valley, California about bringing a product to market. It's a two-day class on November 30th and December 1st. And you can find information about that at foodbusinessschool.org where you can sign up for that class. And if you apply and register by October 22nd, we have a special offer of a 25% reduction in the tuition for that course. So please check that out if you're interested. Also uh, new for Food Business School and the CIA is we have launched a Mastering the Business of Food. It's a Master of Professional Studies degree in Food Business, which is a primarily online program over two years with three short residencies, two in California and one at our Hyde Park, New York campus. Um, but you can earn your master's degree very specifically focused on food business for uh, in two tracks, either a food service track or a food product launching track. So please check that out. You can have a direct link to the page about that master's degree also on foodbusinessschool.org. We would love to um, uh, entertain your questions about that and uh, see an application if this is something that you would be interested in participating in. And then finally, uh, on December 4th is our next uh, Food Biz Plus session, which is called Food Biz Plus the Food Hall Movement. And we are going to be talking with Phil Calicchio, who is an attorney for food businesses and who also is very involved with real estate developers in launching food halls around the country, which is, a, um, what, as he describes it, not a trend, not a fad, but a full-fledged movement uh, to develop food halls around the country and eventually around the world. So that should be a very interesting conversation as well. And again, you can sign up for that uh, free webinar like this one uh, through the website at foodbusinessschool.org. So once again, thank you all for joining me today and talking with Lisa Curtis of Cooley Cooley Foods. Uh, really interesting 